Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we are going to do our second fan-dedicated video, which will be an attempt to puzzle out who wrote the infamous pink letter. This video is brought to you by Matt LaChapelle, a guy who has become more than just a subscriber, but someone we'd call a friend. Now, initially, he wanted us to take a stab at figuring out who Melisandre is, and after weeks of trying, both on his part and ours, we decided to abandon that ship. There was, however, one small victory we managed to salvage in the midst of our epic failure. While rereading all the pertinent Northern Plot chapters in an attempt to figure out who Mel is, we somehow ended up developing a theory on who wrote the pink letter, which is a topic we hadn't really ever considered doing a video on prior to this, as we thought there were a number of theories already out there that seemed plausible, and we didn't really have anything new to add to the discussion. Until now. So, today we will be looking at the contents of the letter, why we think the usual suspects can be ruled out, who we believe actually penned the letter that immediately preceded the mutiny and murder of Jon Snow, and why we think this individual wrote it. So, let's do this. Your false king is dead, bastard. He and all's host were smashed in seven days of battle. I have his magic sword. Tell his red horror. Your false king's friends are dead. Their heads upon the walls of Winterfell. Come see them, bastard. Your false king lied, and so did you. You told the world you burned the king beyond the wall. Instead, you sent him to Winterfell to steal my bride from me. I will have my bride back. If you want Mance Raider back, come and get him. I have him in a cage for all the North to see. Proof of your lies. The cage is cold, but I have made him a warm cloak from the skins of the six whores who came with him to Winterfell. I want my bride back. I want the False King's Queen. I want his daughter and his Red Witch. I want his Wildling Princess. I want his little prince, the Wildling Babe. And I want my Reek. Send them to me, bastard, and I will not trouble you or your black crows. Keep them from me, and I will cut out your bastard's heart and eat it. It was signed, Ramsay Bolton, Trueborn Lord of Winterfell. So who wrote the pink letter? Well, we obviously do not think it was Ramsay, because if we did, we wouldn't have bothered making this video. But before we start explaining who we actually think the culprit was... It seems prudent to begin with the reasons we find it incredibly unlikely that it was Ramsay who wrote it. First and foremost of these reasons is the fact that the Bolton's hold on the North was tenuous at best, and threatening the Night's Watch could very easily turn an already precarious situation into one in which the Northern Lords rebel against the Boltons, possibly resulting in a full-fledged retaliation for the Red Wedding. This is made even more likely when considering the fact that there are dozens of northern lords within the walls of Winterfell that would likely welcome any excuse they could find to bury an axe in as many Boltons and Freys as possible. As Fatal Attraction Barbary said during one of the heated discussions that took place there, the North remembers. And if that wasn't bad enough, there are several northern lords outside the walls that are part of Stannis' army and would also love to kill some Boltons. So much so that they just answered the call of a southern lord and marched through a blizzard to get an opportunity to do so. Now, Book Ramsay is definitely nowhere near as smart as Show Ramsay, but his father might actually be smarter in the books than he was in the show, and on more than one occasion made it abundantly clear that he is well aware of how tenuous their hold of the North is. So, let's just state the obvious. 
This is not a letter that Roos would ever allow to be sent. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking that Ramsey could have sent it behind Roos's back. But, like I just said a moment ago, this isn't the show. Roos is a player, not a piece. And he knows exactly what Ramsey is. And he has almost no faith or trust in him. In fact, while riding to Barrington with Theon, we learn that the quote-unquote bastards boys that Ramsay thinks are his men are actually Roos's guys that are there to spy on him and report back to Roos everything that Ramsay says and does. Roos also openly mocked Ramsay for believing that he actually might rule the North someday. When taking all of this into account, the idea that Ramsay wrote this absolutely ridiculous letter and handed it to a maester at Winterfell and this maester just sent it to Castle Black without checking with Roos first seems nearly impossible. And let's be honest, once Roos did see what was written in this letter, the only place it was going to go is into the nearest fire. There's also the fact that some of the things said in the letter are factually inaccurate and or make little to no sense from a logistical standpoint, both of which lead us to believe it wasn't Ramsay. First and foremost, the Boltons did not defeat Stannis in quote-unquote seven days of battle, as we see Stannis in a Winds of Winter Theon chapter, sitting snugly in a windowless tower while Theon dangles behind him chained to the wall. Stannis does think that battle will be joined any minute, but it hasn't happened yet, and certainly not in some seven-day skirmish as the author of the letter purports. Then, there's the fact that the letter claims that the heads of Stannis' men defeated in this seven-day BS are now mounted on the walls of Winterfell, which, if this was actually done, would have been one of the single most futile gestures of all time. The outer wall of Winterfell is 80 feet high. No one would be able to see them up there. And if you don't believe me, go find the nearest eight-story building, look up, and ask yourself, if someone's head was mounted on its roof, would you be able to see it? Even if someone did manage to notice that it looked like there were a bunch of things mounted up there, there's no way they'd be able to tell what they were. And that's not even taking into account the fact that it's dumping snow. About five minutes after the heads went up, no one would be able to tell what they were, even if they were standing right next to them. So, to anyone outside the castle, they'd essentially look like a bunch of mounted golf balls, which, in my mind, completely defeats the purpose of doing it. So to borrow a line from George, mounting heads on the walls surrounding Winterfell in the middle of a snowstorm is about as useful as nipples on a breastplate. And even Book Ramsey isn't dumb enough to take the time to do something as useless as that, and then turn around and brag about it in a letter, which is especially true when considering that we literally know that there are exactly zero of Stannis' men's heads on the walls. But keep these factual inaccuracies in mind, because we're going to be circling back to them towards the end of the video. Next, being that George is a man who loves his details, let's take a look at what is known about the two letters that we know Ramsay sent earlier and see how it lines up with the pink letter. Fairly early on in A Dance with Dragons, Asha received a letter from Ramsay at Deepwood Mott. This letter was described as, quote, tightly rolled and sealed with a button of hard pink wax. The message within it, written in huge spiky brown letters, likely dried blood, and had a little piece of Theon attached to it. It was signed Ramsay Bolton, Lord of Winterfell, with the signatures of Fatal Attraction Barbary Dustin, four Risewells, a Kerwin, and an Umber, all appended in Maester's Ink. A few chapters later, John received a similar letter from Ramsay, which was also tightly rolled and sealed with a button of hard pink wax, and was written in the same huge spiky handwriting in what appeared to have been dried blood, with the exact same signatures appended to it as the one that was sent to Asha. Okay, now let's look at the description of the pink letter. Unlike Ramsay's two previous letters, this one is not tightly rolled and is sealed with a smear of pink wax instead of a button. There's also no reason to believe it was written in blood or in the large spiky handwriting which seems to be the hallmarks of any letter sent by Ramsay. So, in spite of the fact that all the information contained in the pink letter is consistent with what Ramsay would have been aware of at the time it was sent, 
When considering the fact that George elected to give us copious details regarding the first two letters and they do not line up with what we know about the pink letter, and combine that with the fact that Roose Bolton would never allow such a letter to be sent, it seems safe to eliminate Ramsey as the author of the pink letter. This leaves us with a short list of other candidates that could have written the letter, with the two frontrunners being Mance and Stannis, which just so happen to be the two characters we've always attributed the pink letter to in the past. But recently, we noticed some pretty serious logistical issues that seem to make it impossible. Let's start with Mance. He knows just about everything that would need to be known to write this letter. But he's inside Winterfell, with absolutely no way of getting his hands on a raven, let alone one that happens to be trained to go to Castle Black. He most certainly couldn't go to a maester and ask him for a bird that goes to Castle Black. And sneaking in and stealing a raven would require him to somehow know which ravens are trained to go to Castle Black just by looking at them. In other words, unless he somehow managed to sneak in and correctly guess which raven he needed to steal, the odds of which seem astronomical, we can eliminate Mance as a possible author of the letter. This brings us to Stannis. Assuming he knows Mance is alive, which we believe he does, the moment he got his hands on Theon, he would know everything necessary to write it. But that doesn't really make sense either, when you stop and think about it. In the past, having not properly researched the topic, we thought that Stannis might have written it because he wanted to get Jon out of Castle Black before the morons he leads kills him for doing what needed to be done. But Stannis sent fake Arya to Jon at Castle Black, so sending him a letter that would potentially result in him leaving before she got there would be rather foolish and Stannis isn't a fool. Then, there's the timeline to consider. Roos Bolton said that Stannis was three days' march from Winterfell, and given that he's a Northman who presumably took the weather conditions into account when saying it would take three days to get there, Theon would have arrived at Stannis' camp about three days after he jumped. But why is that important? Theon and fake Arya jump from the walls of Winterfell in Theon 1. Theon 1 is a chapter that takes place between John's 10th and 11th chapters. John's 10th and 11th chapters happen to take place on the same day, with John 10 ending with a horn blowing, signaling the arrival of Torment at the Wall, and John 11 beginning with John talking to Torment. Given that Theon 1 is placed between these two chapters and they both take place on the same day, it stands to reason that Theon's jump and these two John chapters happen simultaneously. It's also worth noting that John's last four chapters, John 10 through John 13, take place over the course of about five or six days, with John's meeting with Tormund taking place three days before Tormund brought his people through the wall, where he stayed for a day or two before bringing his people to Oakenshield, which appears to be slightly closer to Castle Black than Molestown, so let's just say it takes no more than a few hours to get there. He then came back the very next day, a.k.a. the day of John's murder. But why am I telling you this? Because George said that a raven could go from King's Landing to Winterfell in about two weeks. That's a little over 2,000 miles. Castle Black is 800 miles from Winterfell, which means if you do a little quick math, you find out that it takes about five and a half days for a raven sent from Winterfell to arrive at Castle Black. That means that in order for a raven to arrive prior to John dying about six days after Theon jumped, it would have to have been sent immediately or within a few hours of Theon jumping, not the two or three days later that Stannis would have been able to send it, having learned everything he needed to know to write it from Theon. But doesn't that just circle us all the way back to Ramsay being the one who wrote it? Well, no, it doesn't. It simply means that a letter containing information that would be needed to write what became the pink letter, would have to have been sent to Castle Black in the hours that directly followed Theon's jump. Which actually makes perfect sense when you stop and think about it. After fake Arya escaped Winterfell, what are the two most likely destinations she would head towards? Stannis, or to her brother, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who's at Castle Black. 
If she went to Stannis, Roose would hope to get her back after Stannis was defeated. But how would he recover her if she went to Jon? Well, as we said earlier, Roose Bolton would never allow the pink letter to be sent to the Wall. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't have sent a raven to Castle Black, demanding the return of his good daughter should she show up there. Roose's letter would obviously be a, shall we say, far more civilized version of what we saw in the pink letter but could easily have contained the vital information necessary to produce the pink letter, such as Mance's presence at Winterfell and his purpose there, along with his son desperately wanting both his bride and his reek back. So who wrote it then? Now, I do realize that this could almost be considered cruel and unusual punishment, and for that we do apologize. But you're going to have to wait till tomorrow to find out because this video just kept growing and growing and growing and ended up being well over 40 minutes and we decided that it needed to be divided into two videos. And to be honest, even then, we still had a whole third video's worth of material that just might end up being part four of a series that we've been waiting to get back to for a while now. So thanks for watching and we'll see you back here tomorrow.